Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Be sure to join us on Facebook at uh, facebook.com forward slash UNC knowledge. Facebook.com forward slash unc knowledge. Put up questions, suggestions for guests, comments. Um, Dr. David Berlinski is the author of uh, many books, including most recently, One, Two, Three, Absolutely Elementary Mathematics. One, two, three is about the peak of my own mathematical form, but the prose is so irresistible. <clears throat> I challenge, even if you are as much of a mathophobe as I am, you will not be able to put it down. An earlier book, and the book we'll spend most of our time discussing today, is The Devil's Delusion, Atheism and Its Scientific Pretensions. We should establish your professional background is... You're a polymath, but it's mathematics. You're a mathematician. If you have to be one thing, we'd call you a mathematician. Isn't that right? I, certainly, if you feel free to call me a mathematician, but I would so much prefer being called a writer, because that's what I do with that's most what of you my do. time. Right. As it happens, I write a lot about mathematics. All right. Okay. I'm happy to do that. I, I can confirm that you're a writer. I couldn't possibly produce a testimony that you're a mathematician. We're better off that way. <laughs> right. Better off. Fine. Segment one, scientific pretensions. From the devil's delusion, quote, a great many men and women have a dull, hurt, angry sense of being oppressed by the sciences. They are frustrated by endless scientific boasting. They suspect that the scientific community holds them in contempt. They are right to feel this way. Close quote. Explain that. It seems to me that anyone living in the United States, or even in Europe, I mean, this isn't purely an American phenomenon, has this feeling that they're a group of experts, a band of happy experts. And as experts will do, they derive enormous pleasure from telling the rest of us how to think, what to think, what doctrines to uphold, what positions to defend. And this um, conspiracy among experts, if it is delivered in small, manageable doses, for example, in a doctor's office, one is generally happy to receive it. Doctors know what you're talking about. Yeah, take an injection, that's fine. But as a cultural, as a social, as an ideological phenomenon, it gets on everyone's nerves after a while. I mean, what um, headline in any newspaper is more apt to provoke a sense of aggression and disbelief than scientists say? I mean, you know what's coming afterwards. It's not the scientists saying anything. It's the political, rela um, political relations department of the, of the scientific community, their publicity apparatus. They're telling the scientists what the scientists think they should say to the public. And within 24 hours, what serious scientists say has changed overnight. Look at the history of medicine over the last 50 years. One triumphant imbecility after another revealed to be a fraud. So there's a deep, uh, and I think my words were well chosen, deep, hurt, perplexed sense of being oppressed by a scientific community that in many respects doesn't know what it's talking about. Not all, obviously not mm -hmm. all, but in many respects. The boastfulness is what's so irritating. And in this book... The particular form the boastfulness takes that you wish to refute is scientists saying, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. we've discovered we know. that there is no God. No. And we know there's no God because we are scientists. Exactly. And you don't, all right. Exactly. Let me quote uh, from The Devil's Delusion again, David. In many respects, the word naturalism comes closest to conveying what scientists regard as the spirit of science, the source of its superiority to religious thought. But what reason is there to conclude that everything is, to quote philosopher Alexander Byrne, an aspect of the universe revealed by the natural sciences? There is no reason at all, close quote. Now, you need to unpack that for us, but my layman stab at it is, the sciences properly construed have access only to the material world, what we can, what, what we can perceive through our five senses, and there's no reason to suppose that that encompasses all the world or all of reality. Is that the right way? I think that's a good way. It's a, it's a, it's a partial way. Certainly, partial. I would reject the idea that the sciences have uh, exclusive access to the material world. Um, there are other ways of dealing with the material world. The Yankees don't train their pitchers in terms of uh, material science. <clears throat> the development of the human body really is a part of the, of, of the uh, material world, but is not necessarily the focus of a, of a group of science when we talk about performance in the arts. Mm -hmm. 
So there are other access, other ways of accessing the material world. But the, the important thing is that these dominating terms, for example, natural, naturalism, when you try to look at them more clearly, they turn out to be inordinately spongy. There's really nothing under the term itself. I mean, we all know that to be natural is somehow to be good. It's like a Swedish nudist documentary, all natural. Um, you see any number of Swedes prancing on a beach, that's natural. Oh, all right, it's natural. But what does the word mean? What does the word mean? And why should we pay such serious attention to um, scientific propagandists who wish to insist that only this kind of inquiry makes sense. Makes sense scientifically or makes sense intellectually. After all, mathematics is a paradigmatic case of a science that has nothing to do with natural anything. So, so what I'm, again, I'm trying to reduce this to a layman's term. The, what you're saying there is don't be overawed by someone saying, A, I'm a scientist, and B, I'm an atheist. Don't suppose that statement B derives any particular authority That's from exactly statement right. A. That's what you're saying, right? The, the comparable claim would be, A, I'm a scientist, B, I'm an expert on contract law. Right. right. Well, you're an expert on contract law because you study particle physics? Give me a break. Right. Expert on the existence of God because you started the study of particle physics? I, I request the same break, the same suspension of belief, the same absence of commitment to whatever it is you're saying. And these guys are, of course, shameless. They're just shameless. Uh, David, two quotations. Uh, atheist author Sam Harris, quotation yeah. number one. Religious faith is on the wrong side of an escalating war of ideas. Science must destroy religion. Close quote. Quotation number two from the compendium of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Quote, there can never be a contradiction between faith and science because both originate in God. It is God himself who gives us both the light of reason and of faith. Close quote. Which statement strikes you as the most pretentious? Well, the first certainly engenders a single reaction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's Sam Harris. <laughs> okay. It's the sort of thing some of my uh, college sophomores would say when they had uh, read a little bit of H.L. Mencken. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go on to the next subject. Uh, the position of the Catholic Church is much more balanced, nuanced, subtle, and suggestive. Uh, I don't think it's pretentious at all. I think there's an enormous body of serious discussion behind it. Wow. I, I won't go so, as, so far as to say I endorse it wholeheartedly, but it's a reasonable statement. It comes much closer than anything Sam Harris is saying to capturing where we happen to be in the early part of the 21st century. Segment two. Darwin. <clears throat> Good old boy. Good old boy. The devil's delusion. Quote, quote. This is quite a quotation. It's only a few words, but it's... Packs a punch. Yes, it does. Two of them, I think. Suspicions about Darwin's theory arise for two reasons. The first, the theory makes little sense. The second, it is supported by little evidence. Close quote. All right. Let's take those one at a time. Evolution makes little sense. Evolution is in the air. It's so widely accepted. It's what? in the air of the New York Times, that's for sure. And it's in the mouth of every evolutionary biologist, but that doesn't exhaust the cosmos. Uh, let so me ask you a question. If those two propositions, you were to exceed, were completely true, would it change your mind? That, that, that those are the two quotations. That evolution makes little, the theory makes little sense in and of itself. And it's supported by little evidence. David, it wouldn't change my mind because I'm so completely on your side. On ah, this well, I mean, if you were on the other if side. If I were on the other side, yes, but I would do everything I could to, I mean, that, that's sort of, sort of yeah. like the vampire But approach. I assure stop, you, it, stop. it would change no one's mind. And oh, that's really? the curious thing about the discussion. Do you think it would change Richard Dawkins' mind? Mm. Or but, Sam but, but, Harris? But me, why do you say that the theory in itself makes so little sense? Well, what's it say? Whatever survives, survives. No, I knew that before. Because it's I didn't even have to study Darwin. It's tautological. It's empty. It's empty. It's empty. It doesn't tell us anything. Yeah, it survives, survives. I'll believe that. But that's not a theory. That's just a, a string of wet sponges on a clothesline. That doesn't tell us anything deep about biological structure. Yeah, a lot of variations. Children don't look exactly like their parents, thank goodness. And their children will be slightly different too. But does that tell us why startling, complex structures arise in the history of life. No, well, it doesn't have anything to do with this. It. Is, it is supported by little evidence. Now, that, I have to say, 
did startle me to hear you say that evolution is supported by little evidence. What is the, the evidence that's forever being introduced? Well, there's I the can tell you. B b little boy, father took me to the Museum of Natural History in New York. There it is over on the west side of Manhattan. Yeah. And all the plaques say that said then what they say now, which is this dinosaur came at such and such, and is it such and such a period? And there are charts on the wall saying somehow or other how we got from those dinosaurs to creatures that are alive today. That's Not the evidence. Not And there are arrows connecting the creatures. Indeed there are. Hmm. Where were the arrows discovered? <laughs> that the museum won't tell you. There is such a load of inferential adjustment made in even the most plausible evol evolutionary sequence. I mean, take a reptile to mammal. That's a beautiful evolutionary sequence. It looks like one organism is being slotted right after the other. And tremendously interesting changes where bones in the jaw migrate to become the three bones in the ear. The structure of the mouth changes completely. And that's the best. Or the whale sequence. You know, some sort of terrestrial animal becomes a whale over roughly nine million years. But that doesn't amount to an elaboration of anything more than the discovery of fossils that could be slotted in an evolutionary way, could be. But what we lack is the analytic refinement to tell us whether they are or have been slotted in this way. It is simply an exercise in conditional plausibility. Yeah, it could have happened that way. No one on my side of the table is saying, no, it's impossible that it happened that way. What we're saying is that the evidence is remarkably, remarkably constrained, meager, insufficient, inadequate, and lacking all forms of analytic sufficiency. Well, so... I'm on your side, but your strength, but I, uh, overwhelming. I, 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 sort, I, I sort of, no, I feel the impulse to be on your side. I hadn't thought it through in anything like this. So how is it that evolution, that Darwin comes along and within what seems like 27 seconds, he's carried the field, that is to say intellectually, in the academy. He's just carried the field. By the turn of the 20th century, uh, Darwin is the dominant way of looking at the evolution of species, the development of species. How did that happen? I mean, I can see that it's taxonomically useful, that you, it gives you a way of putting the fossil yeah. bones in order. You can, now you have a filing cabinet, you understand what could lead to another, but, but How it, surely did there's it more. How happen that Marxism swept its field, swept it so thoroughly and completely that a hundred million people had to die before someone realized, you know, that's not such, such a swell theory at all. That theory may have certain problems. Now, the same Gravelman doesn't stand against Darwin's theory, but let's face it, academics throughout the Western world form a native conspiracy class. And they are very akin to a criminal class. They'll believe anything. And once they believe something, the conspiracy is held tenaciously. And for, for what were very good reasons, Darwinian theory was accepted in the academic world way before it entered public relations world, the world of the media, world of right. newspapers or television. And it was accepted because it was a form of power. It was an advantageous acquisition to be able to say, well, you guys out there in the Bible Belt don't understand a thing, but we understand life. Uh, knowledge is power in the academic world, and that was a devastating acquisition, the more so since it allowed academics to participate in a cultural war against religion, a rival center of power. Richard Dawkins, one of the most prominent mm -hmm. atheists of the day, quote, although atheism might have been logically tenable before Darwin, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. What do you make of that? Well, it depends what they're filled with, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, put the, put the most charitable. What, do, what, what is he getting at? People well, respond Darwin, to Dawkins. The books sell. They, oh, yeah. That quotation, you just type in Richard Dawkins plus, and this quotation comes up 10,000 times yeah, on Google. Yeah. It gets, it's, it, why do people respond to this? Darwinism provides a mythological framework for a scientific theory. It provides an account of human origins provides an account of biological origins, provides an account of change. And that account at every point is the substitute for a biblical account. That is, the, the accounts that we had all been led to believe, say, before 1859, were essentially biblical. They began, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. To be an atheist before Darwin, Richard Dawkins is arguing, would be to leave 
unexplained. The very point that the Bible or the Christian Jewish tradition does explain the origins of life. In terms of that tradition, the origins of life occur because God breathed upon inert, inactive matter and created life. For the first time, Darwin seemed to provide a framework in which that wasn't necessary. Or more precisely, it wasn't necessary in as far as an alternative miracle was available. That is the miracles currently being promoted for the origins of life. It is a creation myth without a creator. That's right. All right. Segment three, Big Bang. The devil's delusion again. Scientists, the Big Bang and the Anthropic Principle, by the way, we'll cover both if we, if we may. Sure. The, devil, the devil's delusion. Scientists, the physicist Paul Davies has observed, are slowly waking up to an inconvenient truth. The universe looks suspiciously like a fix. The issue concerns the very laws of nature themselves, close quote. Explain that, if you would. Well, Paul Davies is one of a number of physicists, certainly not the only one. Fred Hoyle, who was a, a very serious 20th century astrophysicist, came to the same conclusion. He said the universe looks like it's been monkeyed with by a super intellect. Uh, things are so precisely coordinated, num numerical values for certain parameters are so finely adjusted, and if they were perturbed in any way, things would collapse or the universe would become chaotic or living systems couldn't arise, that we cannot conclude that this was all the result of any kind of accidental process. It's inherent in the design. But when we look at the laws of nature, nothing in the laws of nature suggests it must be this way. The design is inherent in the numerical parameters, and certain properties we see in the universe, but we have no good account for this. The laws of nature are silent. They are what they are. They can work with any uh, numerical, within any numerical valuation or range. So all of these guys, and there's Fred Hoyle, there's Paul Davies, um, Stephen Hawking once was talking about mm -hmm. this. Any thoughtful physicist will say, why is the universe the way it is? Why is the universe the way it is, precisely the way it is? when what we might expect rationally is a generic universe. Generic is a term of mathematics meaning what you would ordinarily expect, the most likely kind of case. And we're very far from genericity in the universe. We're a highly unlikely kind of structure we inhabit. And the question is, why is that? Now, one answer to Fred Hoyle is that the universe looks as if it were monkeyed by a monkeyed with by a super intellect is, it was monkeyed with by a super intellect. Things were set up just so. Another answer is, we really don't know. It's one of the enigmas of modern science. A third answer is, there are many, many, many thousands, millions of other universes, and what is unlikely in this one may be likely when we consider all of them. So how much I'm trying to, the anthropic principle, the suggestion is, your suggestion is that it's reasonable to suppose that it was set up. That is to say, the laws of the universe are consistent with the notion of the Judeo-Christian idea of a creator who set it up. Uh, I think John Paul II said that man is the only creature that God willed for his own sake. So that if the, if the belief is that this is all set up to produce human beings, that's consistent with what we see in the Anthropic. Completely. Okay. But you're not saying, you're saying only that it's consistent. You're not taking it a step further to argue that it is evidence or even suggestive that there may be a creator because after all, again, the crude layman's attempt to grasp the argument here, you spin the roulette wheel and the ball falls on number seven, and you could spend the rest of your life saying, with all those possible s slots, why did it fall on number seven? Why should that have been? Well, it was because it was. It was an yeah. accident, right? So, so you can't really get very far. You can't construct much of a proof of the existence of a no. creator. You can't. No, you can't. But you can construct an argument, something short of a proof. All right. I agree if the ball drops in the slot mark number seven just once, you can say, well, and you get a big payoff. It's interesting, drop ones. If it drops in number seven, again and again and again, at some point you would be entitled to scratch your head and say, you know, the game must be fixed or I must be inordinately favored to be winning it like this. 
But I'm not going to say I'm lucky. That right. doesn't seem to me a perfectly appropriate answer. At some point, luck runs out, as we all know. Right. All right. Uh, I, now we move to the Big Bang. Again, I quote the devil's delusion. The best data we have concerning the Big Bang, the Nobel laureate Arno Penzias remarked, are exactly what I would have predicted had I nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, the Bible as a whole. Close quote. That's a wonderful, wonderful quotation. Now this is one of, one of the, the two people who discovered the microwave background radiation for which he got a Nobel Prize. This is a serious guy. Yeah, he's a serious guy. And uh, he didn't know what he was discovering. He was very lucky he struck pure gold. He thought he was examining pigeon droppings on his antenna. And he finally found a nose, a signal from the microwave background radiation. But he, like many other physicists, initially confronting the facts of the Big Bang. Which you'd better summarize for us. The Big Bang means that apparently the universe exploded into inexistence from nothingness around 14 or 15 million years ago, billion years ago. Uh, it's an occurrence for which we have no causal explanation. Uh, there are plenty of theories about it. There are plenty of attempts to go back behind the Big Bang and see what was going on behind it. But right now, one of the uh, obdurate facts, one of the irremovable facts of cosmology is that 14 to 15 billion years ago, there was a universe, small, intensely hot, intensely compact, intensely curved, and before that there was nothing. Not even space and time before that. And the point is that fiat lux, yes. let there be light, is as consistent with the data as any other explanation. It is precisely consistent with the data. It is a prediction, although not a quantitative prediction, that uh, astonished the community of physicists in the 1960s, astonished Einstein in the 1920s when he realized the field equations of general relativity predicted an expanding universe. And Einstein understood right away it was expanding. It's got to be expanding from something. And he rejected it. He didn't like the idea. He wanted a steady state universe lasting from all eternity, from one eternity to another eternity. But uh, the Hubble data persuaded him he was wrong. Okay, so again, we get, with the anthropic principle, it's not a proof. No. But it sure is suggestive. That's your argument. And the Big Bang, it's not a proof. It could be simply because it could be. But it is, I guess what I'm trying to do is to get you to distinguish between your judgment in these matters, between um, saying it's merely consistent with the Judeo-Christian view of a creator who brought it all into being, or you'd like to suggest that it points in that direction. There's something positively suggestive about it. It's certainly uh, moving and disturbing that in the 20th century, cosmology should have rejected an ancient view of the universe as moving from the everlasting to the everlasting with no origin, and embraced a completely different view, but one that is in no way new. It's part of the religious tradition. I think I would like to, to, to rest my commitment by saying this is strange, unexpected, moving, and very curious. Uh, certainly, certainly, someone who objects as indignantly as I do to claims of having discovered a proof made by the likes of Dawkins or Sam Harris or the other scientists arguing in this realm with respect to the existence of God, I'm, I'm not about to say I've discovered a proof to the contrary. The language of proofs is appropriate to mathematics, not to a discussion like this. What is appropriate to a discussion like this is philosophical argumentation. And we cannot close the day by saying one side is definitively in possession of an argument so fine, so fecund, so powerful that it ends all discussion. They won't end. The discussions won't end. But a little a bit of balance would be welcome. Segment four, <clears throat> where do atheists get their morality? On this program in 2007, an exchange, Peter Robinson saying to the guest, quoting myself here, if Christopher Hitchens does not believe in God, then where does he get his sense of right and wrong? To which Christopher replied, I think it's degrading to state that absent a celestial dictatorship, we wouldn't know right from wrong. I think our knowledge of right and wrong is innate in us. We know we can't get along if we permit, permit perjury, theft, murder, rape. All societies at all times have forbidden such behavior. How does David Berlinski 
respond? I'm not sure. I mean, I've heard Christopher Hitchens say the same thing. I'm not sure that uh, so far as these particular asseverations go, there is any real point of dispute. I mean, I think it's true that we know right from wrong. At least most people do most of the time. Uh, that's hardly the question, is it? Uh, knowledge of right and wrong doesn't take us very far. Why should we be right when we could as easily be wrong? Well, what do you make of this, that Christopher's answer there redefines the common understanding of right and wrong. What he's really saying is useful and not useful. Socially useful and not socially useful. Look at the history of the 20th century and try to account for the history of the 20th century in terms of agreeable usefulness. It is an intellectual category of splendid irrelevance. <laughs> splendid irrelevance. I mean, uh, Nazi executioners swabbing out the death cells from their loads of blood or communist czars sending people, uh, communist uh, tyrants sending people to Siberia to the to the uh, Arctic death camps, they had no use for usefulness. They had nothing constraining their behavior in terms of the traditional apparatus of a celestial dictatorship. I think that word is fine, although there is some opprobrium attached to it. But that's exactly what human beings have always said. We need someone cracking the whip over us. Right. So I take your discussion of morality and the 20th century and the devil's delusion to be another form of the argument that you make with the anthropic principle and the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. That is to say, religious people would say there is natural, there is an objective, right and wrong, there is a law of God. And if you don't obey it, terrible consequences will follow. And you make the point that terrible consequences have followed. did follow. Yes. Right. So, Again, that's not a proof for the existence of God, but it sure is suggestive. That's what you're saying. We could put it in the fashion of Christopher Hitchens. It's not a proof for the existence of God. It's certainly a suggestion about his usefulness. <laughs> okay. So, all the laws of heaven and earth, Dr. Johnson remarked, are unable to prevent man from his crimes. Surely relaxing the laws of heaven and earth shall not dispose man to better behavior. That seems to be self-evident. All right. Now, David, we, it's impossible to discuss the horrors of the 20th century without mentioning the Holocaust. And you have a very moving dedication here in The Devil's Delusion to your mother's father, your grandfather. And you write the dedication in German, and it concludes in Auschwitz verschollen, missing in Auschwitz. But much more to the point, disappeared. Disappeared. In Auschwitz. Disappeared in Auschwitz. Better translation. So, how do you handle the datum of the Holocaust? In some ways, it's an utterly elementary question. You may find it as a question uninteresting, but it's not easy to answer. If there were a God, how could such a thing happen? That's a terribly difficult question. But, but look, if we take the period from 1939 to 1945, look at 1945. The Jewish people yet live, Hitler's target. The Third Reich, that lies smashed to smithereens under the tank treads of Russian tanks or blown to bits by American and British airplanes. And everyone who survived the Third Reich must survive, drowned in mourning or consumed with grief. That doesn't strike me as a whole lot less than a biblical adjudication of those war years. Not pleasant, but no one reading the Old Testament comes away convinced that the God of wrath is uh, essentially a Rotarian. He is a God of wrath. If he chose to kill nine million people to make a point and then destroy their persecutors, remember Lincoln's second inaugural address, the conclusion he reaches. We must still say, as was said long ago, righteous and just are the decisions of the Lord. Mm. He was talking about a terrible war, too. In The Devil's Delusion, David, you construct a kind of um, syllogistic progression uh, to show that this is another way you show that religious questions can be perfectly reasonable. Let me quote it to you. If the universe is contingent, there is no saying whether it existed forever. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe. That's point one. Point two, if anything might not exist, then it is reasonable to ask why it does exist. 
Point two and point three, well, why does it exist? I mean, really? Yeah. How does David Berlinski answer the question? I don't think there is an answer in terms of the traditional uh, body of knowledge we associate with physics. I don't think physics is now in a position to answer that question. And my suspicion is it will never be in a position to answer that question. But it is a very good question. And it is a question that, while it cannot be answered from the physical tradition, can certainly be asked from the physical condition, tradition. And that's something very interesting, the existence of a class of questions that can be asked within a physical theory, but not answered within a physical theory. And I think when you look at those kinds of questions, well, why does the universe exist? What are the causal conditions that make a universe possible? What are the necessary and sufficient conditions for bringing our universe into existence? Then you have the beginning of a sense of intellectual humility. You're pretty sure that Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and even my friend Christopher Hitchens can't answer those questions? Yeah. All right. Segment five, our final segment, alas, taking science on faith. In The Devil's Delusion, you write, and I quote, Western science is saturated by faith. What do you mean? You run an experiment. You put your hands in your laboratory equipment. You go away for a cup of coffee. You take a nap. You come back. You expect the experiment to be con continued, and that when you put your hands in the laboratory equipment, it will be the same. Things are continuous from one, one moment to another. The universe doesn't shake itself in, out, in and out of existence. Things are stable. Things are predictable. Things are satisfactorily amenable to investigation. These are all items of faith. How do you know any of these? You project backwards from the modern era to say what could have happened in imperial times, Roman imperial times. How do you know the same universe was there a thousand years ago? You're going to leave this table in about... Uh, 30 seconds, how do you know a chasm isn't going to open at your feet, Peter? You don't know that. You take it on faith. faith. And there are thousands of remarks. These, these, are, these are remarks within the philosophical tradition pointing out the extraordinary extent to which, in order to advance scientifically, there's an enormous body of assumptions that have to be in place. And those assumptions can't be defended. No science, Aristotle said, ever defends its own first principles. And we can't either. It's just a logical point. All right. Another quotation from The Devil's Delusion. Members of the National Academy of Sciences are by and large persuaded that there is no God. Men and women in their millions that there is. Why should that be so? There's a tremendous advantage in uh, belonging to the National Academy of Sciences. And the National Academy of Sciences is an institutional source of authority and power. If these guys were going to defer to the Vatican or to a council of rabbis or to a group of Muslim clerics, much of their power and influence would be discredited. But that is to take a cynical view. The less cynical view is that a certain amount of education, a certain amount of immersion into a physical theory, and I think the same thing is true, immersion into a legal theory, tends to displace any other kind of ide ideological affiliation. And uh. that is transmitted or transmuted into a form of denial. There is only one truth that happens to be the truth of plasma physics. That's what a plasma physicist is. And why not? 50 years studying plasma physics, that's the only truth you can see. So you're suggesting that atheism, as it expresses itself among scientists, is a kind of deformation professionnelle. Oh, of course. Of course. You, you, you find the same thing in people who are completely committed to wrapping Cuban cigars. That's, a, that's how they think of the universe. The universe can only be illuminated in terms of a large cigar being wrapped. It's All not right. a source of surprise. The world of matter, again from the devil's delusion, revealed by the physical sciences, does not serve to endow materialism with a familiar face. There are black holes and various infernal singularities. Popping out of quantum fields, the elementary particles appear as bosons or fermions. Reality is remarkably Baroque, and it is promiscuously Catholic, small c, yeah. Catholic. So here, throughout this book, David, one place you stated explicitly, you state, I do not take as the burden of my argument to prove the existence of God. You're right. I take it only to demonstrate that the scientists cannot yeah. disprove the existence of God, fine. 
And that, that's, but, but the way this book operates, that's a kind of baseline. You get that on every page. But there are other pages where if you were graphing the reader's reaction, intellectual reaction, there would be little spikes here and there in which it seems that you're saying more than that. It seems that you, well, right here, you say that science, physical science, properly understood, a true understanding of the physical, the material world around us, not only does it not mute or displace a religious sensibility, it excites a sense of wonder and mystery. Well, I agree with that. I, I had no intention of concealing that. I know not seems, my lord. <laughs> no, I agree completely. That is a, a position in the book that I do want to adopt. It certainly does, to the responsive mind, excite a sense of religious possibility. The passage about material objects that you quote is one intended to show the vacuousness of the material as a category, even within the heart of physics. There is no sense of a material object that covers the sort of inquiry that physicists are doing. Black hole is not a physical or material object. Look, you smack your hand on the table, and then you smack your hand on the table again. How many times have you smacked your hand on the table? Two. Where is that number two? Is that a physical object? No, of course not. And that pervades the sciences. The idea that the world of matter is the world that matters is simply not true. Or if it is true, and there's a wonderful remark by the logician, Kurt Gödel, in talking about materialism. Gödel was, of course, a great genius, and uh, he had no patience for the physical sciences. And he said the only way materialism ever, ever survives is that all of the properties that we would want from a non-material world, from a psychological or biological or religious perspective, are just uh, slapped on top of a material object, and we describe it as material. That's no answer. I mean, mm. even the most primitive parts of physics, force, is force a material something? We have a very limited understanding. Even 300 years after Newton, what is force? What is force? We don't know. What is energy? Are they material? It's hard to say. Final question, alas. <clears throat> let me give you one, one more time. Let me give you two quotations and yes. just ask you to respond. Quotation number one requires a little bit of a setup. The, the uh, late philosopher Sidney Hook, remarkable man. Old friend. Oh, is that so? Yeah. All right. I didn't know that. I never had the chance to meet him. He oh, died a year or two before I he came here to the Hoover Institution. Well, but Sidney Hook was an avowed atheist, not agnostic, but atheist. And a friend of his, this was a story told to me by that friend, said to Sidney Hook, Sidney, if when you die, you discover to your surprise that there is a God after all, how will you explain yourself? And Sidney Hook replied, quote, I tell God that he had provided insufficient evidence. Close quote. That's number one. Here's number two. Psalm 8. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Close quote. Which quotation, which worldview, do you find, to use Richard Dawkins' phrase, more intellectually fulfilling? Well, I've heard Sidney Hook say the same thing. In, oh, is that, a, is that an old line of, of Sidney's? Yeah. All right, all right. What are you talking about, David? There's no God out there. No, just, just, just a lot of hooey. I'll have a tuna sandwich. <laughs> um, no, there's, there's very little substance in that quotation. And, of course, there is a point of presumption in that particular argument, which Bertrand Russell also used. The point of presumption is that human beings constructed as human beings are constructed could so interact with God as to be persuaded by the countenance of the deity when they were left unpersuaded by the evidence of his handiwork. That's a remarkable presumption. Much more reasonable, it seems to me, is those who cannot see the handiwork will not be able to see the countenance either. There is a limitation, a kind of aspect blindness at work. Not everyone appreciates Mozart. It's just a fact. The second quotation, I think, is, uh, is, a, is a beautiful quotation, but there's a fine line from Gerard Manley Hopkins. Um, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will sh uh, flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. I think that captures... That captures very elegantly the spirit of the psalm, but also something of Sidney Hook. Something mm. of Sidney Hook. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? 
That's something I always asked Sydney. You know, we always talked. We did talk about that. Hmm. He thought it was um, a New York imperative to be very tough all the time. But what he thought in his heart of hearts that he kept to himself. Uh, actually, I want to ask. This is going to be the final question. So, we know that this program uh, is watched disproportionately by kids, based college kids. Hmm. So you have somebody in college who's going to. I don't know if you went through this when you were an undergraduate. You're so. You, you being you, you probably went through it at the age of seven. But it's the sort of thing that I went through when I was an undergraduate, which is you show up at college, and you look around and you realize that a lot of very bright people are atheists, and since. Most people, just numerically speaking, come from these millions and millions who do believe to assume the existence of a God. There can be a really quite disorienting moment. And given, your, given the various proclivities, the time, the course interests of the student, the student may wish to investigate this in as rigorous a way as an 18 or 19 year old can. What advice would you give to such a student? To investigate the question? Yeah, yeah. I would suggest to any student entering college now, 2011, do what I'm sure he hasn't done. Go read the Old Testament. That should be your first challenge. You know, I always ask my students, have you, read the, uh, have you read the Bible? Oh, yeah, 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 I've read the Bible, sure. Uh, but when I interrogate the students, it turns out reading the Bible means they have a Bible on their bookshelf. Uh. I said, have you opened it? Yeah, we've opened it, but opening it doesn't mean reading it. Um, the Old Testament is the greatest repository of human knowledge and wisdom in the history of civilization, any culture, any time, any place. And that really should be the first point of discussion because every attitude current today in the discussion, from Richard Dawkins to me to Christopher Hitchens to lonely uh, pastors in the Bible Belt on Sunday morning ranting from a, a particular text, is discussed in the Bible. And there's a character in the Bible who expresses that point of view. And there's sympathy expressed for that point of view. And there are reservations expressed by the sympathy. And it's an enormously complex, rich, dramatic piece of work. That's the first. All right. David Berlinski, author of The Devil's Delusion, Atheism and Its Scientific Pretensions. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us. In the famous tale of the emperor's new clothes, you'll recall, all the high officials at court and all the leading men of the land agreed to pretend that the emperor was sumptuously arrayed. Only one little boy told the truth. Today on Uncommon Knowledge, David Berlinski, mathematician, philosopher, and essayist, in one brilliant, elegant book after another, Dr. Berlinski has attacked global warming, Darwin, and other scientific pretensions insisting that the emperor is naked. Uncommon knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson, a mathematician, philosopher, uh, and essayist who has taught at institutions including Stanford, Rutgers, and the Université de Paris, David Berlinski is the author of books including The Devil's Delusion, Atheism and Its Scientific Pretensions, The Deniable Darwin, and the forthcoming, to be published next year, The Best of Times, which the author has give, permit, been kind enough to give to me in galleys. David Berlinski, welcome. Thank you very much for having me again. <laughs> <laughs> scientific Pretensions from The Devil's Delusion, quote, a great many men and women have a dull, hurt, angry sense of being oppressed by the sciences, oppressed by the sciences. They're frustrated by endless scientific boasting. They suspect that the scientific community holds them in contempt. They are right to feel this way, close quote. David, explain. Don't you kind of think that that one is obvious? I mean, when you run into a, any kind of group of scientists, I mean, not the low-level scientists, the bottom feeders, but physicists or mathematicians, 
they really don't waste any time telling you how much smarter they are than you. I mean, that's true. We all have that experience. And the global warming issue is one issue. The biological issue is another issue. But it's more than that. It's, it's kind of this feeling that because they're so smart, and that's true, they are smart, no question about that. They have accepted as an obligation and as a pleasure the prerogative of telling the rest of us what to think, not only about the sciences, but about everything. <laughs> and that is oppressive. Well, uh, we'll come to the 20th century in a moment, with the gruesome aspects of the 20th century, but there were some splendid aspects of the 20th century, including, for example, electric light, indoor plumbing, decrease in infant mortality, and wouldn't the scientific establishment say, we, science, we scientists, brought that to you. You owe us some deference. Science gets places. It enables lives to become better, more comfortable, healthier, more rewarding. Well, do we really want to say that an immense amount of deference is due to the community of physicists for the invention of the indoor toilet? <laughs> I don't know. That seems to stretch to me. I love the toilet as much as the next man. But it's a 19th century invention, not a 20th century invention. And it had very little to do with the sciences. It was a brilliant example of technology applied successfully. Also, electricity, lighting. Penicillin. I've got you on that one, haven't terrific, I? Terrific, terrific invention. Couldn't be better. Agreed. It's a great achievement. There's no question about it. But the issue is not this particular triumph. Look, I mean, quantum field theory is a great achievement, too. Mathematics in the 20th century, a profound achievement. The issue is the overall overall omnipotence, intellectual omnipotence, that is assumed by the scientific community. Global warming. Now, as far as I know, you haven't written at length about the science of climate change, but you have written this, and I'm quoting here from a post you put up on Ricochet this past summer, quote, global warming, who knows? Not me for sure. But what I do know is that climate science is and has been in the hands of intellectual mediocrities and pious charlatans, close quote. For sure, for sure. Not everyone. My, my buddy Dick Linson at MIT, who is a tremendous skeptic about global warming, is not uh, a pious charlatan. But anyone who read those emails from East Anglia... Who the leaked read, emails. Yeah, the leaked emails. And after you stopped chortling and really paid attention to what they're saying, their entire scientific position is, well, we've got a very weak theory. It's supported by so much gibberish in the computer record. Let's just hide that from criticism and uh, suppress those people who don't agree with us. That is the public posture on global warming. Now, that's changed. Mm -hmm. It has changed. There's a lot more subtlety in the issue now. And even the people who are most alarmed are willing to admit, well, you know, 15 years it hasn't been much warming at all. In fact, there's been no warming. Maybe we should factor that in into our self-congratulation. That's a good thing. But the real issue is that glo global warming is an imponderable. Global warming may be increasing to uh, dramatic and harmful extents, but we don't know that. The science isn't clear enough. More from that Ricochet post of last August, quote, what is so striking is the tendency of the scientific community both to an extravagant boastfulness, you've explained that, and to a barely concealed eagerness to help itself to an ever larger portion of the national wealth, close quote. You wish to assert that some large component of the motivation among scientists to alarm us about global warming is their desire for federal funding. All of it not just some large part, all of it. The amount of federal money going into global warming, client re climate research, is just staggering. It dwarfs the paltry contribution of the ever-zealous oil companies. I mean, there's a huge, a huge federal investment in this project. And it can't be stopped. It's ongoing. Uh, if you want to help yourself to some of the national wealth, <clears throat> A firm to the National Science Foundation or the National uh, Institute for Energy or any of the federal agencies that you've got a red-hot proof that global warming is increasing. And um, you can go to the very best Parisian restaurants the next day. I guarantee it. 
Uh, so do, but I'm, this isn't just global warming. Right. This is across the board since the 1950s. The dominating motivation of the science is just to help themselves to ever more swag. Now, I can sympathize. It's a human emotion. But let's not blind ourselves to the sheer facts. This is, as the budget increases and has increased from 1950 to 2000, a dominating emotion in the biological sciences. 90% of the time is, is spent on grant renewals. So, so uh, while we're talking, I want to get in a moment to Darwin, uh, where you're at least as outrageous and provocative. Not at but all. Very modest. Very, very modest, modest. Very modest. But on this question of funding of the sciences, that is an artifact largely of the Cold War. Yes. Federal funding began pouring into universities during the Cold War because it was believed that on defense issues, space, all of this, we were in a competition for our very national life. Now, we hear over and over again that we ought to build down the Defense Department because the Cold War is over. We ought to bring troops home from Europe. Indeed, we have been bringing some troops home from Europe because the Cold War is over. No one says it's time to end the tight relationship, at this point, deeply symbiotic relationship between federal funding and research universities. Does David Berlinski say that? Sure, I just said it. Let's end it now. But before we end it, there's a fundamental I thought, question. I thought we were all supposed to believe in basic research. That's one of the uh, Not few. me. Not me. What good does it do? If some guy is, is maniacally determined to investigate the structure of the subatomic universe, Gesundheit, let him go do that. But why should the taxpayers be billed for a $16 billion superconducting uh, collider in Texas? It was, it was rejected. So instead, the money went to, um, to Switzerland uh, for the Large Hadron Collider. But this is a question that's very rarely asked. The, the virtue of fundamental research can be defined intrinsically. It's important to some people. But the virtue of fundamental research in a democratic society, that's not a question that can be reserved to the scientific community. That's got to be a democratic question. And it never is. Because when the federal government provides funding, it has engaged in coercion. Of course. It has Your raised, it has taken money away from citizens. Therefore, the scientists bear in a democracy a particular burden of justifying the good they are doing. That's for sure. And the justification is inevitably, invariably, ineluctably always the same. Boy, this stuff is interesting. <laughs> Maybe to some people. The deniable Darwin. Quote, Darwin conceived of evolution in terms of small variations among organisms, variations by which a process of accretion allow one species to change continuously into another. Life, however, is absolutely nothing like this. Close quote. You know, the, w the right way to think about Darwin's signal achievement to 1859, there is an achievement, there's no question about it, is to say it's in the tradition of Newtonian mechanics, where the underlying structures of change are all continuous. They move seamlessly. You can't do Newtonian mechanics without the assumption of continuity. Mm -hmm. In certain respects, it was a natural assumption for Darwin to make. It was the next step. If this works for the orbits of the planets, the continuous motion around the sun, elliptical motion around the sun, well, something like that might well work for the changes in species. That was a dramatic idea in 1859. But the extent to which bio biology reveals sharply discontinuous processes and structures was not properly appreciated in the 19th century. I mean, speciation is still a hypothetical event. We have very few dramatic examples of the transmutation of species. It may be possible, but you know it's also possible to transmute base metals into gold. It's just very expensive. It's not what happens ordinarily. Mm. So, for example, again, in the Deniable Darwin, you write about the Cambrian, the so-called Cambrian explosion. Right. The fossil record before the Cambrian era, I'll try not to get this wrong, to me, to, to me the Paleolithic and the Cambrian, that's all, a, yes. but we get a fossil record that's very thin before the Cambrian of 600 million years ago. And then the Cambrian comes along and suddenly there are a lot of species in those rocks and we don't see them gradually taking shape. 
the species appear fully formed and they exist and then some of them become extinct, but we don't see them developing. We just see them as they are, as long as they exist. Correct? Not entirely. No, right. okay. Close. All right. Uh, there is a very rich body of evidence about life forms before the Cambrian. Oh, there is. Right, I was mistaken. Karen strata. The real puzzle, and it is a much deeper puzzle, is that they seem to be uncoordinated with what takes place in the Cambrian. We have one set of organisms before the Cambrian explosion. We have an entirely other set of organisms after the Cambrian explosions. And if you take a Cambrian structure and you move it back, you frog step it back in time, there comes a point where all the paleontologists can say is, well, there must be ghost lineages in the past, but we haven't put our hands on them. A long time to be putting your hands in the muck looking for those ghost lineages. A long time has passed. And, and this is something, just I, I want to make sure that the intuition is correct here. This is something that actually ought to be accessible to nearly any layman because we've all seen movies, American Werewolf in London, in which a human being changes into a werewolf and you actually see frame by frame the nails grow. The, you ought to see something like that albeit at a pace of... You're, you're really million. tempting me now. <laughs> well, well, but you ought to see some, some sort of transformation from one, from one mode of existence to another. You ought to see, right? Isn't that what's well, missing? Well, we do see profound transformations from infancy to adolescence to adulthood to, to old age and death. That is a, a completely unacknowledged example of a trans, transmutation. We all take that for granted. Right. And that, that demands a profound explanation in its own right. But the, the transmutation across species lines, that's just been very difficult to see. We see small variations in species, things changing slightly. For example, the beak of the finch changes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it seems to change cyclically. It gets bigger, fatter, more narrow. The thing has a snout, it doesn't have a snout, goes back to the way it was. We don't see the, the finch becoming an elephant, for example. All right, that's an extravagant... Uh, analogy. But even in cases where we seem to see a record in the bones, in the stacked dead of the paleontological record, we really can't quite make sense. Take, take for example, the whale transition about which I've spoken uh, a number of times. Yeah, the modern whale, big, fat, blubbery thing, swims in the ocean, seems to have derived from a land-dwelling Animal about the size of a very large rock. I mean, it changes all the time. I used to think it was about the size of a cow. Now it's been demoted in size. What we cannot, and we, we have the intermediate fossils. We do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what we cannot figure out is how did that happen in the appropriate window of time, about 8 to 10 million years? One thing, we don't have a measure to tell us how many changes we should expect. Mm. And for another thing, when we try to compute the changes that would be required, to take a 1954 Chevrolet and make of it a Nautilus-class submarine. We very quickly say, you know, thousands and thousands of changes. Well, is the whale any different? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. Once again, the deniable Darwin. Time and again, biologists explain the survival of an organism by reference to its fitness and the fitness of an organism by reference to its survival. Now, I want to make sure I understand what you're arguing there because whereas what you just discussed requires deep knowledge of the fossil record, which neither I nor most laymen will ever attain, what you're arguing here, I believe, is something that anybody who ponders it for a moment ought to be able to see, which is to say that the fundamental statement of, Darwinian, of the Darwinian concept, survival of the fittest, is purely tautological. There is no objective criterion by which we can see whether it actually works or not. That is, um, why has an organism survived? Because it's the fittest. How do you know it's the fittest? Because it survived. So in and of itself, the Darwinian conception doesn't convey as much well, it's not falsifiable at a minimum. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not a very esoteric point. It was made as soon as uh, Darwin published his work. The objection was raised that the fundamental idea 
absent an identification of fitness in qualitative or quantitative terms is vacuous. And everybody, everybody says to himself, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right, that's not telling us a whole lot. It may be an important statement in other ways, but it's not telling us a whole lot because if we don't know what fitness really comes to a qualitative account of those properties that will allow an organism better to reproduce in the future, then to say survival is attributable to fitness and fitness is an evidence of survival doesn't tell us a whole lot we didn't know before. Yeah, sure. Those organisms that survived, survived. Don't have to take biology 101 to know that. Right. Um, we hear a lot about the scientific consensus in support of global warming, but that is as nothing by comparison with the scientific consensus committed to a Darwinian understanding of the way life emerged and developed on Earth. It's absolute. It's absolute. So. Here you sit across from me and say, oh yeah, well, the tautological aspect of it was noticed right away. In Darwin's own time, people pointed that out. We've known for decades now that the fossil record is not what you would expect. There are some serious sure, conceptual gaps. problems. There are gaps. So why, why is it that, well, I mean, all you have to do is look at the way every time you write an article, now that we have the internet, you're assailed. The comments are vicious. You're assailed as unprofet this, that, and what, what, there's a level of commitment which is not rational. Is that right? Explain it. Yeah, I, th I think that's true. Look, look, a lot of what I write, um, there's a source of deep, indubitable enjoyment poking my finger in somebody's eyes. I'm not going to deny that. And uh, the biological community is so self-satisfied, so smug, so sure they have all the answers that somebody who comes along and gives them a poke in the eye, of course they're going to respond with a form of indignation that is uh, almost rabid. That, that, that goes without saying. But the much deeper question, I think, is why has this story, and that's really all that it is, why has this story, oh, say, from 1960 to the present, you know, there was a lot of skepticism about Darwin after he published and throughout the first part of the 20th century. Why has this story become so governing to so many people? Well, one answer, one answer is that with the decline of religious faith, with the decline of any belief in the possibility of religious experience, and that's a fact of our contemporary sure. life outside the sure. Islamic world, say, there's a great hunger for a creation story. And what better creation story could be afforded than the one told both by the physicist, Big Bang, who knows how that happened, Darwin, spontaneous emergence and development of life on Earth. No external, transcendental, spiritual creator required, none welcome. That's a powerful motivation. That's a powerful motivation. Design. In the deniable... Darwin, you quote the famous argument, 18th century English theologian, William Paley, who said quite simply, if you see a watch, you know there was a watchmaker. That's what the argument comes to, and he used that metaphor. There it is, a very good watchmaker in your case. David Berlinski writes in The Deniable Darwin, quote, it is worth remarking that it is simply a fact that this old-fashioned argument is entirely compelling. We never attribute the existence of a complex artifact to chance." Close quote. Do we? Well, I mean, you... Uh, Bill we Cl agree, you see? Bill Clinton. <laughs> I can quote Bill Clinton in favor of your own argument, which is, uh, Bill Clinton, if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know it didn't get there by itself. Same argument. Look, th there's a level of skepticism that I think becomes self-defeating. If someone says, looking at a watch, I don't know, you know, sand mixed with water, action of the waves, we, we all understand right away, without the need for argument, without the need for argument, that's not plausible. I think any discussion of Darwin and biology has to begin with that acknowledgement that we have very powerful intuitions which have not in any way been overturned by biological research, that the plain facts in front of us suggest the level of complexity, which we cannot yet define, agreed, that we find very difficult to attribute to the kind of processes 
that we see explained in Darwinian theory. Look, even Richard Dawkins says the same thing, and every biologist following Dawkins says the same thing. Living creatures give the appearance of design. Mm -hmm. Francis Crick says, oh, yeah, that's true. We've got to remember they're not really designed. Why do we have to remember that? Maybe that's the truth. Mm -hmm. And that's a truth. That possibility is not acknowledged. Again, in the deniable Darwin, you tell the story, it's not a story, you give an account of the MIT physicist Murray Eden, who ran some calculations. He estimated that the number of proteins from which life might be constructed numbers 10 to the 50th power, a very big number. And the possible combinations of these proteins from which life might have arisen is 20 to the 250th power, which is a number so large as to be... It's meaningless. It's me meaningless. Incomprehensible. You write, quote, a number larger by far than the second, seconds in the history of the world since the Bing, Big Bang. And then you write this, quote, in some sense, evolution knew where it was going. What do you mean by that? Out of this incomprehensibly large possibility field, so to speak, there must be some mathematical way of describing this. Somehow or other, evolution didn't have time to experiment with all the chances. That's for sure, isn't right? it? Isn't it? I mean, if we're, if, we're, if we're looking at a space such astronomical size, 20, 250th power, clearly we're not talking about any kind of random search through that space. When I, when I made this point in, in Paris at a mathematics seminar, my friend uh, René Tom, the mathematician, got up. He immediately became excited by the whole thing. He said, yes, we need a theory of canalization. And he, he wandered to the blackboard and he said, let's assume an n-dimensional abstract vector space. And canalization on the vector space, I lost. I, I didn't understand what he was saying. But the idea immediately is obvious. that when we're Dealing with this enormity, there has, there has to be directed paths mm. throughout the space. Now, to say that evolution knew where it was going assigns a degree of agency to evolution that I think is probably inappropriate for sophisticated people like us. But uh, All right. it's a well, vivid metaphor. So let me quote you one more time from the deniable Darwin. I want to move on to history, but one more on evolution. You quote the Bible. You quote the Hebrew scriptures, David. God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let fowl fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven, close quote. And then you continue, and who on the basis of experience would be inclined to disagree with the biblical account? An act of intelligence is required to bring even a thimble into being. Why should the artifacts of life be different? Out with it, David. Are you saying that there is an intelligent designer, a being, a god? Does it seem to you that I was saying that? <laughs> <laughs> it no, seems no, no, to no, me no. Look, that look, you, here's what I you do come close say. and then you step back. Exactly. Got to protect both flanks. <laughs> um, it seems to me the intuitions of mankind should not be spurned or scorned carelessly. For sure, there's something sometimes wrong. Aristotle was wrong about physics. Our intuitions about moving objects are wrong. There's no question about it. It's not impetus that counts, but acceleration. But when it comes to living systems, we are among the living systems, and I think our intuitions about what's going on are far more profound than they are in the case of mathematical physics. I think the universal reaction the universal reaction, the default position of the human race is that some creative act was necessary to bring the panorama into existence. And I share that default position. I have here, David, only the uh, galleys that you were kind enough to send me. The best of times. So let's take a moment. The best of times will be published. What you have is part one. There's part two and part three, which unaccountably remain to be written. I see. But um, the best of times will be published when the book is written. Uh, yeah. All yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, but there's plenty to talk about in part one. You begin this book, this meditation on history and violence, the best of times, with the great Whig historian Thomas Babington Macaulay, who insisted that history was making 
progress, that it was going somewhere. And you quote Macaulay to this effect, quote, we, this is Macaulay, we rely on the natural tendency of the human intellect to truth and on the natural tendency of society to improvement, close quote. Why do you start with that? Because um, Macaulay writing in 1830, 1831, was expressing a very reasonable assumption about early 19th century society after the French Revolution after the Congress of Vienna in 1815, that at least in England, we had finally come to a position where we could see all of the Enlightenment promises not fulfilled, but gathering force. That is perfectly reasonable to say that in 1830, 1831. He extrapolated to the far future. He, he started talking about natural tendencies as if they were inexorable tendencies. And he gave a very, very uh, eloquent defense of the idea that finally in 1830, after thousands of years of tumult and strife and violence, we have seen our way forward, just as the Enlightenment figures predict, predicted we would see our way forward, to ever-increasing progress. This is a very powerful idea. Now, this idea did not really survive in the 20th century. After 1914, between 1914 and to my way of thinking to the present time, no one could talk about the natural tendencies of societies toward improvement or the natural tendencies of the intellect toward truth. That would just be absurd. Nonetheless, what is interesting is the idea has come back. And the idea is almost a default assumption of the scientific intellectual community. That's what I find so interesting. Well, the idea, so here's what, um, you haven't written parts two and three, so. They're even better. So, uh, I'm sure. Macaulay is writing, I'm testing this something out here. I'm saying, I am, the thought is occurring to me as I speak, so I will misstate it, it will occur misshapen and I will misstate it, I'm sure. But Macaulay is writing, it occurs to me, not just when we begin to understand, well, you can gaslight. This is, this is when the toilet begins to change sanitation in London and so forth. But he also feels, I think, a kind of unity of moral and material progress. Oh, yes. And that is, that is not available to us, is it? After the First World War, after Nazism, after the Holocaust, after the killing fields in Cambodia, we're left with material or scientific progress alone. Nobody would argue that moral progress, that, that our moral life is getting anywhere. Isn't that right? And isn't that, in some ways, isn't that, doesn't that feed back into the scientific pretension? We're the only part of this civilization that's making progress, that's going anywhere, we scientists. Well, I think that's absolutely true. I think that's absolutely true. But don't forget the, the Whig interpretation of history Macaulay's view of history as a progression. Um, if, you, if you take away the specifics of Macaulay's view of English, the development of English history, English kingship, a lot of other things, and you just look at um, what I think is the profound idea that Enlightenment philosophy has given to skeptical and intelligent men and women, the only set of tools they could possibly use to come to grips with the world. That is reason, rationality, a faith and progress, a doctrine of equality, and a variety of ancillary doctrines. Mm -hmm. Then you'll find that Macaulay very nicely expresses a kind of a opinion about the world that is astonishingly common. It's certainly the default position in the academic world in the United States. Mm -hmm. It is true that every university in the country now is talking about solving the world's problems. Oh, sure. One phrase or another, one, one phrase like that or another is in every fundraising raising letter you will receive. Uh, well, then you write about the, you write at some length about the First World War, which is the, the huge civilizational catastrophe. Immolation of Immolation. European civilization. And throughout the 20th century, you write that of uh, some 230 million victims of violence slaughtered in the First World War, killed in the Holocaust, starved by Stalin and Mao, 
the killing fields in Cambodia, and on and on. And then you quote Hannah Arendt. It is in the very nature of things, human, that every act that has once made its appearance and has been recorded in the history of mankind stays with mankind as a potentiality long after its actuality has become a thing of the past. Close quote. That's arresting enough. Here's what David Berlinski adds. I'm quoting you. It is in this sense that the 20th century, having introduced into human history crimes never before imagined, is immortal. It is simply there, an obelisk in human history, black, forbidding, irremovable, and inexpungible." Close quote. I think that's true. God help us, I think it's true. When I read that, I thought to myself, I believe I understand how Germans of my generation feel. They can't get out from under their own history. And they never will. And what you're saying is, none of us can get out from under their that history exactly or Soviet right. history. Uh, because we share an identity with humanity itself. To lose that would be to lose something of enormous importance. We cannot allow ourselves to forget what the 20th century really represented. And just as the crucifixion in Christian theology is beyond space and time, so the crimes of the 20th century are in a place of their own. They're not simply incidental acts of violence. They fundamentally change the way we should, not the way we do, but the way we should think about human history. To seriously look at the 20th century, the First World War, the Second World War, 60 million deaths, the Holocaust, the inconceivable project of exterminating European Jewry, the Great Terror, Mao's lunatic experiments with the Chinese people, to seriously look at all that. You cannot go back and read Macaulay. You just can't. I mean, you can read him, but you can't take him seriously anymore. And what I find so um, dismaying is that while I have that particular point of view to espouse, there are plenty of people who are going back to Macaulay who are saying the same thing. Uh, 20th century, well, you know, a lot of rotten things happen, but those are statistical anomalies. They happen from time to time. The First and Second War, well, one of those things that just happens. We should expect a big war every 10,000 years, and we just happen to live through it. That, to my, to my way of thinking, is simply insane. You can't read Macaulay, but you argue, again in the best of times, that you can read St. Augustine. Quote, I'm quoting you now. An analysis of the First World War adequate to its magnitude would require a work comparable to St. Augustine's City of God. Augustine's position, of course, is that he's Bishop of Hippo. He's in North Africa. That's right. As the right. During the first sack of Rome, he witnesses the civilization of which he himself represents one of the greatest flowers. Deeply immersed. Deeply immersed, deeply educated in the classical works. And he, he sees across the Mediterranean a civilizational collapse. He's not in the position we're in of guessing at how much longer things will run. He lives through the sack of Rome. He sees it. All right. Augustine could grasp events, I'm continuing to quote you, David, only by a radical reinterpretation of human history, the categories to which he appealed are no longer available to historical analysis, close quote. In what ways did Augustine reinterpret history, and why can't we access his categories? I think, I think the, um, the praises, the summary you gave, was dead on, exactly, exactly right. Augustine watched a comparable catastrophe. I mean, don't forget, classical civilization lasted a whole lot longer than modern European civilization. And it was a magnificent achievement in statecraft, art, politics, science, and that it should just crumble before his eyes. You know, the dates are very interesting. 360, 370, 380, classical civilization, Roman civilization is still functioning. 30 years later. Alaric invades and Saxon. 30 years yes. later, there's a catastrophe. And Augustine played around with the idea that perhaps, perhaps there was an explanation 
in terms of the violence and stupidity of the pagan past. And he actually commissioned someone to, to look into it. A very interesting book, title of which I've forgotten. And he came to the conclusion this isn't, this isn't right. The only explanation adequate, commensurate to the magnitude of events cannot be historic, historical, it has to be theological. It has to involve a limitation of our association with the city of man and a refocusing our attention on the city of God and to see the interaction between the two as part of a divine plan. Now you cannot, you cannot in the 21st century argue that way anymore. You simply cannot. It's no longer part, for better or for worse, of our intellectual experience. You cannot argue that way, comma, and be taken seriously in faculty lounges. That's right. Isn't that what you mean? Yes. Didn't Benedict XVI argue just that way? I don't know what Pope Francis will argue. Aren't there wise men? Aren't there, yeah. aren't there learned you're rabbis in Israel right. who can insist on grounding? Isn't yeah, I think you're absolutely right. But the point is we do live in a society where the house of intellect is coordinated with only a, a finite number of microphones. And th those microphones are connected with the academic world and with a certain part of the journalistic world. I think that's true in the United States, it's true in Canada, England, France, throughout Europe. There is a doctrine amounting to a dogma. And according to the doctrine and the dogma, this way of thinking, no matter what Benedict says or what the rabbis in Israel say, is not part of the interpretable canon. It cannot be introduced. Should it be introduced? Would it make more sense? Have we lost something of tremendous value in our culture? Don't forget, we are part of a Judeo-Christian culture. My answer is yes, of course. Of course. We have lost something of value. We can't think we cannot think in those terms any, anymore. We cannot attain the truth about the catastrophe. Well, I don't even want to prejudge it. We cannot attain to the truth about the times in which we live. It's very difficult, and it's becoming progressively more difficult for a very simple reason. Um, those in a position to know the 20th century from the inside, where the horror really lay, are dying which means that for historians to look at the 20th century, they will have to look at the 20th century the way we look at the Napoleonic era now. And the natural human bonds of outrage, sympathy, and horror will be sundered. And this is very alarming. It means that the whole part of the 20th century, which could have been the centerpiece for a reinterpretation of human history, is destined to disappear without a trace. The real meaning. Now, you argue, you come close to arguing for design in science. Are you arguing for some kind of overarching design in human affairs? I believe there must be some sort of overarching design in human affairs, otherwise history is a series of discon disconnected, rather meaningless events. But I see no evidence that history is a series of disconnected, obviously meaningless events. We can see it whenever we do small historical research. Look, there's an obvious connection between the catastrophe of the First World War, the Russian Revolution, the Russian Civil War, the development and rise of Nazism in Germany, the Holocaust. These things are not random occurrences. They have an inner logic. And if we're sensitive, we can discern the inner logic. And sometimes no great sensitivity is required. Look, it would be inconceivable to think about killing all of Europe's Jews if European civilization had not so successfully killed nine million of its brightest and most able young men in the First World War. These are connected, coordinated events. Mm -hmm. David, two final questions. Yes. Let me read to you the antiphon for mass this very day. O wisdom of our God most high, guiding creation with power and love, come to teach us the path of knowledge. God, guiding creation with power and love. Do you buy that? I hope it's true. <laughs> oh, fair I enough. Hope so. That's a fair enough answer. I mean, look, the, the real answer is I am as much part of the same intellectual culture as everyone I'm criticizing because I find it impossibly difficult to get out of it. 
There is no double position, being in it and looking at it from the outside. And that's a difficult position. I think that's where we all are in the West. The Islamic world has a different set of procedures, different concerns. I, I acknowledge that. But as anyone who, who came to maturity, intellectual maturity, in an academic setting and is responsive to academic standards of taste, discretion, probity, goodwill, of course I find it very difficult to evade the sense that I'm in a, a straitjacket. I'm suffocating in a straitjacket. But the minute I try to remove the shackles, I get anxious too. And I think we all feel exactly that way. Mm -hmm. Exactly that way. Last question. In, in The Devil's Delusion, you write, uh, I'm just going to quote you a, a kind of um, syllogism w with which you end that book. If the universe is contingent, there is no saying whether it existed forever. Maybe. Maybe not. If anything might not exist, then it is reasonable to ask why it does exist. Well, why does it exist? No, I mean, really. How does David Berlinski answer that question at this stage in his life, having written that book a decade ago and having the best of times in hand? I don't think. I hate to keep giving you evasive answers. I, I mean, I feel after an hour interview like that, someone like a seal slithering around a pier. But I think the honest answer is, boy, are you making a mistake if you want the scientists to answer that question. The physicists are not going to give you any help. David Berlinski, author of The Devil's Delusion, the deniable Darwin, and as soon as he finishes writing it, to be published next year, we, we feel certain, the best of times. David Berlinski, thank you. Thank you for having me on. It was a pleasure. Good questions, too. Thank you. To, oh, David, from you, very high praise. For The Wall Street Journal and the Hoover Institution, I'm Peter Robinson.